Today we're going to continue with Randall Helm's book on gospel fictions. First, today, let's talk about the trial of Christ. Now what's very interesting, seems to be common sense, but some of us don't uh, notice it until other people point it out. The trial of Christ. Mark's account of the trial, page uh, 118, Mark's account of the trial must be speculative, since there were no followers of Jesus uh, to report on it later. The disciples had all deserted him and ran away, quote unquote, at his arrest, Mark 14, 50. Early Christians, in composing an account of the trial, followed the usual method of gathering information about Jesus. In the absence of real evidence, they again went to the Old Testament. In the book of Daniel, quote, Then the governors and satraps sought to find occasion against Daniel, but, found, but they found against him no occasion. And compare this to, quote, the chief priest of the whole council sought testimony against Jesus Christ in order to kill him, but they found none. So, if you compare those two, yes, they are very similar. And yes, Mr. Helms makes a very good case that the New Testament authors of the Gospels were simply drawing upon stories from the Old Testament in order to incorporate their version of what they believe the Messiah was to be. As I have stated, not all Jews believed in a messianic figure. They didn't expect a human being to be the Messiah. Rather, they expect a messianic age. There are those kind of people who have their own sort of messiah complex who believe, I'm sure, that the messiah is an historical figure, an actual human being. But, there is very little, if any, historical evidence of such a man, and there certainly isn't any evidence that that is what the Jews expected, a messianic figure, a human being. Now, let's talk about the crucifixion. This is an important point. This, along with uh, the resurrection story is very is a very important point. I'm going to simply read this. Um, now there is a contention between whether Christ carried his own cross or if it was carried by another man. Okay, starting on page 122. If it may hold, the author of the fourth gospel knew Mark's work. Why did he assert so strongly, contradicting Mark, that Jesus carried his own cross? You think this probably isn't a major point of contention. But Mr. Helms, as he does so well, points out why this is important. Again, the answer is the matter of theology rather than history. The fourth gospel was written in part as an attack upon Gnostic Christianity, which hold, held that the Son of God was not really crucified. Some Gnostics, in fact, held that Simon of Shiren not only carried the cross for Jesus, as it says in Mark, but was himself killed upon it. 
John dealt with that argument simply by eliminating Simon altogether. Moreover, John has an entirely different picture of Jesus' condition at the crucifixion. In the synopsis, the implication is that Jesus is too weak, following his scourging and beating, to carry his own cross. But for John, Jesus is entirely triumphant throughout the Passion. John presents no cry of dereliction from the cross, but insists, insists the dying words are a cry of, trumpet, uh, of triumph. It is accomplished. Uh, John 19, 30. Such a figure was quite capable of carrying a cross. The important point here being many Gnostics at the time that these Gospels are being written, the Gospels that are now canonical, many Gnostics were saying that Jesus wasn't even crucified on the cross. Many Gnostics continue to believe that. Many Christian Gnostics. Now, I personally have my own opinion about this, and I'm not going to get into it, not right now. But my opinion does differ somewhat from the Gnostic beliefs, but I do consider myself a Gnostic. So what's entirely important here, and it is a contention that is worth being contentious about, is whether or not the authors of the four Gospels are telling the truth. Because there are Gnostic Gospels. They had just been buried, literally buried, for all these years until the 1940s. This is a reawakening of the Gnostic Church. It's happening now. It's happening now, thanks to the internet, thanks to people out there who can see, they can perceive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which resides in those who are preaching this Gnostic Gospel. Let's talk a little bit about the resurrection. Page 129. The earliest extended statements about the Easter experiences appeared not to be in the Gospels, but in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It dates from the early 50s, but in 20 years after the crucifixion, viewed in the light of the Gospel account of the resurrection, Paul's statement is an interesting one, for it does not say, does not say as for what it does not say, as for what it does. I handed on to you the facts which have been imparted to me, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised to life on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and afterwards to the twelve. Then he appeared to over five hundred of our brothers at once most of them who are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James afterward, and to the apostles. None of these appearances in anything like the sequence Paul lists is depicted in the four Gospels. Moreover, not one of the Gospel resurrected appearances is identical with those listed by Paul. Paul did not know the Gospel resurrection stories for the simple reason they hadn't been invented yet. And for four evangelists who wrote 20 to 50 years after Paul either did not know his list of appearances or chose to ignore it. Perhaps most surprising of all the differences is Paul's failure to mention the legend of the empty tomb, which for the writer of the earliest gospel, Mark, was only public, visible evidence for the resurrection. Though Paul vigorously attempts to convince the Corinthians at Corinth, some of whom apparently doubted that Jesus indeed rose from the dead. If Christ was not raised, your faith is as nothing in it. He never mentions this most striking piece of evidence. Indeed, it is probably never even heard of it. It was a legend that grew up in Christian communities different from his own. It may have even post-dated his death. 
for Mark wrote almost 20 years after that letter to Corinth. Worse yet, Paul would not have agreed with Mark's theology, even if he had known it. For Paul, resurrection meant not the resurrection of a corpse involving the removal of a stone and emptying of a tomb, but a transformation from the dead physical body to a living spiritual one. Flesh and blood can never pass the kingdom of God. And again, we get into the Gnostic idea. Gnostics say that Christ was not resurrected in the flesh, but that he came back as a spiritual being, as a transformed being. There would be no need to roll away a stone. There would be no need for the tomb to be empty. He came back as a spiritual entity, is what the Gnostics say. And... I don't doubt that they're wrong, but that they're right. I don't doubt that they're right. And finishing up with the book, crucial differences between Mark and Matthew's account of the resurrection. Page 137, Matthew was equally unhappy with yet another aspect of Mark's account and invented more fiction to replace it. In Mark, the woman, quote, brought Aramaic oils intended to go in and anoint Jesus' body on the Sunday after his death. As they approached the sepulcher, they were wondering among themselves who would roll away the stone for them to enter the tomb. When they looked and they saw that the stone, huge as it was, had been rolled away already. A satisfied Matthew radically changed the account, saying this was about daybreak on Sunday, when Mary of Magdala and the other Mary came to look at the grave, suddenly there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He came to the stone and rolled it away. In part, Matthew made the change because he disagreed with Mark's resurrection theology. Mark apparently believed the resurrected Jesus was a resuscitated corpse who required that the stone be moved from him, for him before he could leave the tomb. But Matthew's view was closer to Paul's. The resurrected Jesus had a spiritual body. Thus, Matthew writes that the women came not to find the stone had been rolled back already. But as they watched, the angel removed the stone from an already empty tomb, Jesus earlier have, having passed through the stone. These are, cru These are crucial, crucial, things that we need to deal with as people. Otherwise, we don't move on as a human beings, as a race of people. People are clinging on to this, whether it's their own personal ego that makes them not want to tear themselves away from this book, whether it's fear, whether it's just simply easier to go with the crowd. You cling on to this book, it's going to become like a stone. What it's going to become is like a stone. And it's just going to drag you right under the water with it. I promise you, Things are changing. People are waking up to a new awareness. And you're going to either have to get on that train with them, get out of the way, or get mowed down by it. Change is coming, whether you like it or not. The question is, are you going to continue to kick against the pricks? Oh, it's right, it's all true, it's all true. Oh, you're evil! You are evil, Randall Helms! You don't know what you're talking about. You can't. Because I know. Foolish, childish nonsense. If you don't tear yourself away from it, it's going to drag you down. 
like a rock. 